To be honest, when I was asked to give this talk about balance in medical education, I thought, no, that's an impossible talk. Uh, that's like justifying quantum mechanics and relativity because they can't exist in the same universe, but they do. Um, so the best thing is to introduce it honestly. There isn't a lot of balance that you're gonna find in medical education or whether it in, in medical school, in dental school, in residency, in fellowship, whatever. There isn't a lot of balance during that time. So what you have to do is keep looking ahead. I mean, one of the strategies is keep looking ahead to graduation, however far down the road that is, when decision control is returned to you and then decide what you wanna do with the balance margin issue there because it's more attainable after education. I'm just being truthful and realistic to you so that expectations aren't raised um, because expectations are, are really everything. Uh, the history of medical education, I'm not sure about dental education, is this. Uh, 30 years ago, not 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, how was medical education done? Well, there were too many patients, there were too many diseases, and there were too few doctors, and so everybody had to work really, really hard. And so it was a model really of super saturation. We just, uh, we just threw you into the middle of the ocean and you learned how to swim, and that's, we found out that that's a good way to train uh, doctors and presumably dentists as well. And that's the model that was started up those many, many long decades ago and continues even to this day. And the reason it continues to today is that it works. It is a lousy way to live. The residency that I taught for 15 years, I would tell them this often, it's a lousy way to live, but it's a good way to learn. That sounds like a bad sentence, but let me justify it and explain it and walk through it a little bit. You are paying a price for that gift for that quantity, that entity you want at the end of education. And that entity, what you want is clinical competence. Believe me, believe me, you want clinical competence at the end of the period of time. Um, and the price you're paying for that goal is your life. To a certain degree, you're giving away portions of your life in order to gain that thing of clinical competence. Um, upon graduation, you know, I've been, I've been there many times with residents in the middle of the night and they complain incessantly in residents on Monday mornings and on Wednesday afternoons and they talk about, you know, uh, 36 hours on or in the middle of the night with that breach or I was in the hospital and it was 4 a.m. and I had worked for 18 hours and then that, that septic baby came in and I had to do the spinal tap. They never complained at all at graduation time. I didn't hear even a whisper of complaint about having been there in the middle of the night. They were very, very glad that they had that experience and now they knew what to do. You get out there and practice and those things come in, you want to know what to do. I hope I'm explaining this well enough that it isn't easy now, but the model works for delivering a very valuable commodity. We, don't, we do not want to release incompetent doctors on an unsuspecting public, and neither do you want to go there. As you get closer to graduation, you're gonna be wondering about your competency. And this is one of the things that the, uh, that the medical, medical education system uh, will deliver. Um, we're trying to humanize the process. I, I really think in many ways the process still is difficult, but clearly for residency, it has been humanized. And, and even uh, with the resident work hour reform, I think all residencies now have some, uh, re, some uh, amount of that. And I was, I was involved in that in my 15 years of residency um, at, at many points of the different uh, rotations that the residents would go through. But even as we're trying to humanize the process, the forces in the other direction, the more and more of everything faster and faster, the explosion of medical knowledge, the, the, uh, the increase in the PDR, the new pharmaceutical agents, and all the things I've been talking about is almost pushing us in the direction of overload as fast as we're trying to decompress overload. This is a strange thing for me to have to say, but it's so obvious. I think it's probably occurred to an awful lot of physicians. We violate most, if not all, rules of good health in the name of teaching health and even practicing health. Um, now, I'm going to go on from here 
to explain about things that you indeed can do. But I want to be honest up front that you are in a very noble profession, a very, very important profession, a profession that demands competence, not only for the sake of the patients, but for your well-being. Because when you go into seeing these patient encounters, lots of different experiences, making decisions on the run very quickly sometimes, just using your instinct sometimes, um, you'll want that gift of clinical competence. Let's talk about stress. Is stress a bad word? I don't know if you've had much teaching on stress yet, maybe even in undergrad, and we use it as a bad word. No, we say, I'm really stressed out today, and I use it as a pejorative, but stress is a neutral word. God created the stress mechanism. The, the most medically rigorous definition of stress is our physiologic adaptation to change. Any change comes into your life, your physiology adapts to that change. Small change, large change, good change, bad change, it doesn't make any difference. You have to adapt to that change. Now, there's other ways of defining stress, too, as just negative or difficult change adaptation, but the most, migor the most rigorous is, is indeed this one. So if a little bug crawls in here, you know, or if a rabid dog runs through here, I mean, that's different. Public just clearing house sweepstakes finds you and hands you a check for $10 million. Uh, you, win, you win a new car, you know, that's a stress. That's a stressor. Um, if I gave you a stress-free life, would you want that? you would die. A stress-free life is fatal. If you never had any change or challenge or novelty in your life, no deadline pressures, nothing to do, nothing to accomplish, it's literally fatal. I mean, sit here and stare at a wall for three months, we'll come back and check your pulse, you won't have one. So you don't want a stress-free life. How about a low-stress life? Would you want that? It's a trick question, and even I'm tempted to answer it wrongly. We've done the studies. We put people in a low-stress life for a month, a high-stress life for a month, and we say, which do you prefer? What do you think people prefer? A high-stress life. The low-stress life is boring. So you don't want dead, and you don't want boring, but you don't want hyperstress either. Hyperstress has its own set of problems. Uh, this is stress versus productivity curve, and on the bottom axis, you can see stress. So when there's no stress at all on the left-hand side, there's no change, there's no challenge, there's no demand on the system, no deadline, nobody looking over your shoulder, uh, patients aren't expecting things from you. Attendings aren't expecting things from you. There's no tests. Uh, what do you get done? You don't get anything done. But as the stress starts to increase, then the productivity starts to ramp up really rapidly. You can see that the curve goes up quite rapidly at the beginning. Then it starts to level out, and then you hit point A. Point A just means you're not God. You know the difference between God and a physician? God doesn't think he's a doctor. We have an MDD syndrome problem, you know, so we don't learn about point A. Sometimes it's hard for us to learn about point A. Human limits were part of God's original creation plan. Don't insult God's creation wisdom. He put human limits, says you have 24 hours a day, I don't care how pious you are, you can beg God, he's not giving you an extra two seconds. A certain amount of intellectual ability, a certain amount of physical, a certain amount of emotional buoyancy, resilience, a certain amount of money in your wallet. These are limits that God put within us to preempt any ambiguity about who's God and who's not. He's God, I'm not. He's the infinite one, I'm the finite one. He's the unlimited one, I'm the one that has limits. That's exactly the way he set it up, and so don't kick against it. You are remarkable in your skills. If you weren't remarkable in your skills, you wouldn't be here sitting in front of me. You are a chosen group of people that have remarkable talents and abilities, and that's a very good thing. You're not God, okay? It's okay that you're not God. And so you don't want dead all the way over there in terms of no stress. You don't want the boring part of the curve, but you don't want to live over at point C either. That's where you get into fatigue and exhaustion. You'll spend a lot of time over there by A, B, and C. You're going to spend a lot of time there. Uh, and so you just need to know that up front. And I'll tell you what to do with your attitude when you're, when you're over in those uh, periods of time. Um, stress versus burnout. Uh, I, I, it was mentioned a little bit over here. I believe that burnout is a real phenomenon, uh, not just a psychological, but also a physiological phenomenon. If I go out and take a tree here, and I bend the tree a little bit, and I bend it a little more, and bend it a little more, and I let go, then it straightens back up, and that's stress. But if you bend the tree and bend it and bend it a little more and bend it a little more and then you hear a crack and you take your hand off and the tree stays like that, that's burnout where something breaks. And uh, it's very common. It's common in medical school. It's common in residencies. It's common in practice. Uh, so you need to understand that burnout is real. 
Uh, there's still life after burnout, but uh, most of the healing is by scar formation. There's lots of comorbidities. I mean, it's better if you can pull back before it happens, but don't fear. It isn't the end of life. It happens to lots of people, and it's out there. So think about the stress bending the tree. That's fine, because a tree that is stressed like that by wind is a stronger tree. It has deeper roots. You being stressed will make you a better doctor. It'll quicken your mind and your attention. It'll, it'll give you some skills. It'll serve you well later on and you just don't want to go too far to hear that crack, that snap. And help each other out, by the way. I mean, that'd be a good thing. Stress switching, do you understand this concept? If you're really, um, if you're really perseverating on something, I mean, something's happened to you and it's in your mind and you just had it up to here and there's so much going on, don't go sit on the couch and just sit on the couch and look at the wall because your brain is still in that same circumstance. Do something that takes your mind off of that. I like to mow my lawn. I mean, that's a stress switch for me. Some people like to play basketball or watch a movie or read a novel. Whatever works for you to take your mind off of the stressor is what you need to do. If I, uh, if I go speak somewhere and I'm really exhausted when I get home, by the time I get to my next speaking, I, I don't even remember where I was. I mean, it's totally gone. And so it's a way that my brain automatically kind of clears out uh, previous... Um, I'm not gonna call you a stress-inducing environment here, but <laughs> you need to know that you can take more than you think you can take. Uh, when I said that uh, stress is our physiologic adaptation to change, uh, God and the system will test you in terms of your adaptability. Uh, you might think you can't make it, but try to go out for the Marines. You'll find out you can do more than you think. Go out for the football team. You can do more. It's to become a marathoner. Um, this whole process will strengthen you and will give you some resolve and allow you to have uh, some, some of the energy and focus that you need later on. And you can take more than you think. You're still not God and there are limits and you understand. Learn what depression looks like. A lot of people will get it from time to time and then seek help if, that, if you have that. I mean, seek help, talk to other people. Uh, it's, a, it's a common occurrence and that's a sad thing actually to say, but it, be careful about it. How do you decompress though? When you have these experiences, how do you decompress? How do you pull back? How do you get yourself healthy again when you get home? We're gonna be talking a lot, almost all the rest of the slides are that. One thing is sleep. A lot of times you're gonna be, when you get into being on call, a lot of times you're gonna be sleep deprived. And if you have an opportunity to sleep, just go ahead and sleep and try to catch up as much as you can. So, uh, Sleep deprivation makes cowards out of everybody. And as a matter of fact, the average American gets three hours, almost three hours less sleep per night than 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And so sleep deprivation is, is widespread across our, across our, our nation because of the uh, progress and the more and more of everything faster and faster. But sleep can be a great therapeutic aid uh, when you have the chance for it. Uh, keep your sense of humor. The system might tend to drive that out of you a little bit, but just uh, hang on to it. Um, you know, be like a kid. If you're going into pediatrics or pediatric dentistry or something like that, you know, it's impossible to have bad hair day when you're three. Um. <laughs> the baby is not unhappy. The baby has a Mona Lisa smile here. The baby is... If you lose the ability to laugh, you're going to have a long few years ahead of you. But if you can, if you can laugh, laugh, there's something very magical about laughter. And I think God knew life was going to be tough. One of the gifts he gave us was laughter. Another one is music. Another one is nature, for example. Those all are therapeutic and decompressed. And if, if you can get a crowd laughing, you can tell them anything. I use that all the time in my speaking. Sometimes I have to tell difficult things. Well, you get them laughing, you get them laughing, it decompresses the resistance, you know, lifts them up, opens them up, and then you can just drive a truck right through that. Uh, never take yourself too seriously. Um, there he goes. The best, best kind of laughter is when you laugh at yourself. You never run out of material. There's a guy in southern Florida, uh, Hurricane Andrew came through, I think, was that a category five, four or five or something, did devastation in southern Florida. And there's a guy who lost his house, and he put a sign in the front yard, open house. Um, <laughs> he will heal faster than his neighbors were. 